Both John Chemistry students, Dr. Hayes here, lecture uh, eight on taking this idea of light that has wavelengths and frequency and certain speeds and using that to probe the inside of the atom. And then some amazing things have been found out. So that's what uh, this lecture is all about. And uh, we're going to get started. So, oh, I had a little question on there. Which color of light has the least energy associated with it? And the least energy is the one closest to the red. So anything that's purple and blue, those have uh, shorter wavelengths and higher energy. All right. Now, there is a great video. You guys need to go watch this video. Um, and it goes through, it's the Clash of Titans. I showed part of it in the other video. I've got the link here. You need to go watch. You get to learn these guys, Niels Bohr, uh, De Broglie, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, Schrodinger, these guys who just transformed our understanding of the atom to the modern view that we have. It is very entertaining, very interesting. And in the uh, video from minute 25 to about the 30 minute mark, so about five minutes there, talks about Niels Bohr and his contribution, how he thought about using light and how that could probe the inside of the atom. Great stuff there. I encourage you to go uh, look at that. Um, and it, normally I would show that here. I'm afraid if I put it on YouTube, it's gonna like take it down and cause some problems. So please go watch that. So I'm gonna go on. And uh, so Bohr uh, provided some understanding that says, man, light can kind of give it, light can give us the, so a detailed picture of what's going on with the electrons in different levels, quantum levels, jumps inside. The electrons can move around. Why and how could that happen? Well, this is where Louis de Broglie came and he worked with radio waves. He was a radio operator. And he, he thought that maybe all objects, particles could have wave-like properties. And he developed a, a concept here based on uh, Einstein's equation that was relatively new, e equals mc squared, and combining that with the equations that we uh, know and that, we've, that we were just working with, uh, really the one that's hc over lambda. So he said, well, if energy is related to mass and energy is related to wavelength, I bet wavelength and mass, a particle that has mass is could be related. So he substituted, uh, so MC, he made these two equations equal to each other. So E equals MC squared and E equals HC over lambda. So HC over lambda equals MC squared. And then you divide both sides by C. So then you get the uh, MC equals Planck's constant divided by lambda. And then uh, he rearranged it, solved for lambda and uh, came up with the De Broglie equation that relates um, the wavelength, oh, my hair is kind of messed up. Uh, anyway, uh, the mass and velocity of a particle to its wavelength. So this just blew people's minds away that, wait, particles can have wave-like properties? Well, that's very interesting. So we kind of use it, and I kind of use it in this format, where he's, if you can calculate the wavelength that a particle has, if you know its mass and you know its velocity, now, this can be confusing because we've just been seeing something that looks like a V over here, but that's not a V, that's nu, that's frequency, 1 over S. Now, this is going to be velocity, how fast something is in moving in meters per second. So we gotta, we got to keep that straight. All right. And so there's my note there. All right. So... Now, there's some, now we want to think about the relationship between mass and the wavelength. If you think about it for a second, if I make mass bigger and bigger and bigger, that means I'm dividing by a smaller number. If mass goes up, the wavelength goes down. Okay. And the smaller the mass, okay, means you're dividing by a small number, and the larger the wavelength. Mm, okay. So this is kind of interesting. So, so larger mass, short wavelength. Now, you're going to uh, get a problem like this to help illustrate um, what's going on, how this calculation works. There's some important things. This calculation looks kind of easy, but there's a few little tricks. So here's an example. Could we figure out the wavelength that goes with a baseball? 
uh, a baseball uh, weighs 115 grams and let's say you threw it at 100 miles an hour, which is super hard to do. And if you can, you could get a job in the major league baseball. Now, in order to use this, we've got a, um, oh man, that all jumped in there. We're gonna use the uh, lambda equals Planck's constant times the mass and in, um, in that, oh, not, not velocity or not new, but the velocity. So here's the tricky thing. We've got to convert uh, kilo, uh, the mass in grams into kilograms. And so, well, why do I have to do that? That's one kilogram. So that's 0.115 kilograms. You will see, you will see. In order for this equation to work out, the mass has to be in kilograms. Critical, or you'll be off by a lot. Now, the next thing for these equations to work is the right units we need to make 100 miles per hour, convert that into meters per second. Now there's a lot of ways to do this. You can use an online calculator. You can use a bunch of conversion factors. And um, uh, I'm not gonna quite show that right now, but I am gonna show um, that I did convert it. And uh, what, did I, what did it turn into? Cause I have it right here. Well, here's Planck's constant. And then here is the mass. Oh, and then here is the velocity, 44.7. Now, oftentimes we'll give you the velocity in meters per second, but I probably will rarely give you the mass in kilograms. And uh, so we gotta be looking for that. So just convert to kilograms. Now, why does this work out with these units? Why do I have to have meters per second? Why can't I just throw in any old unit? Because you'll get the wrong answer. All right, here's how it works. Now the units for, um, Planck's constant is joules times seconds. Now mass, if we have it in kilograms, and then the speed in meters per second, this is what it makes it all work out. Here's why. Well, if, I, uh, if I'm dividing by, because I'm up here now, if I divide by a second, this puts the second up here and I end up having joules times seconds squared. Now, using the definition of a joule right here, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. You see where I got that? It's from a definition we talked about at a previous thing. But anyway, I'm going to use that and substitute the joule with this definition. And then that shows up over here. All right, so now the joule becomes a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So doing that, the kilograms can now cancel out. Uh, one of the meters cancels out with this meter, and then the two second squares uh, cancel out. Now I'm left with meters, and that only works out when I'm using the mass in kilograms and the velocity in meters per second. And then my wavelength will end up being in meters. Okay, so now I'll plug in my Planck's constant, the mass in kilograms, and now uh, through all of that, I've now figured out the wavelength that we have for a baseball thrown at 100 miles per hour. Now OWL has this really nice table. It's, it's actually a great thing to think about. So 10 to the minus 34 meters. Wow, that is like super tiny. Over here, uh, we see a table. And, you're, and in one of your problems, you're gonna to have to figure out how to get uh, the wavelength and compare it and see what category it's in. So if it's between 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus seven, you'd be in the UV, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus eight meters for the wavelength. This is all has to do with lambda, the wavelength then you're dealing with these uh, wavelengths that are in the UV, X-ray, or gamma ray. But anything that's smaller than 10 to the minus 20 cannot be detected. So we would almost say at that point, the wave-like properties are so tiny, we can't even tell that they're there. And that's what happens to a baseball. That's what happens with you, me, we all, brick walls, computers, they all have uh, wave-like properties. But the wavelength associated with them is so tiny, it doesn't really affect anything. Well, that's interesting. So that's for relatively large things. What about if you were to get something that was smaller? Okay, so this for a baseball is too small. So what does this have to do with an atom? We're getting there. We're getting there. It's super close. Let's talk about electrons. See, it turns out electrons have wave-like properties. Well, how did they figure that out? One was this famous double slit experiment. I'm gonna play on this little video. Here. Electrons have wave properties. If we shoot a beam of electrons through thin metal foil, the atoms of the foil cause the waves to interfere with each other. 
The interference, or diffraction pattern, can be recorded on photographic film as a series of concentric circles. Concentric circles, well, that doesn't sound too exciting. Well, that means that was wave-like property where the electrons were going through more in places they were not. This blew people away. There's another experiment called the double slit experiment. You should go look this up. The double slit experiment, famous experiments that illustrated that electrons act like waves. Well, why is that? Let's compare it with the de Broglie wavelength that we would calculate with an electron zipping along at uh, nearly the speed of light, 1.9 times 10 to the six meters per second. So, okay, thank you. We now have it in something that we can um, work with. So what's the wavelength associated with this? So here's the mass. Okay, I'm gonna, this, we're gonna make this one easy. It's in kilograms. Uh, I found it in a book. There's the speed. So I got M and V, H, that's Planck's constant. We've got, it's just a number. So we just plug those numbers in and guess what we get? And so remember, uh, if we put it in kilograms and meters per second and everything cancels out and you're left with just meters over here and uh, 3.83 times 10 to the minus 10. Uh, well, is that measurable? Was that on that scale? And so sure enough, if I convert this to nanometers, it turns out to be 0.383 nanometers. This is actually in the UV region. That is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is why now, because of these calculations, the thought that de Broglie had, the things that Bohr was doing, our understanding of electromagnetic energy, we're like, oh, electrons have wave-like properties. Wow, they could be acting like waves around and inside of the atom. So what would we get? 10 to the minus 10? That is right there in the x-rays. Sorry, my bad. I thought it was UV. X-ray in the x-ray region. All right, so electrons, particles, they have mass, little mass, but they have measurable wavelengths. Whoa, that means they can interact with light in very interesting ways. Okay, so this is where Bohr said, wait a second. So maybe they act like waves and there's like a wave, it's a wave and it's, it's around the nucleus of an atom and maybe it's not an electron moving around, it's just a wave. And you can only put certain whole number wavelengths in and uh, in, around the atom. And so that's where the electrons are. And that's why they're in orbitals in these different areas and they can move back and forth. And, uh, and so like, and, you know, four wavelengths can fit in this way. And if you try to fit in five, then it would have to be farther away, but it's in a certain location. And that, but you couldn't have a four and a half uh, wavelengths. So this started to really open up scientists' minds about how the electrons are arranged. Now, this is kind of fun if you have a chance. Take some whole wavelengths and on a strip of paper, and you'll find they'll turn out to be concentric circles. And uh, you, you're kind of getting the idea of what uh, the electrons are like inside. So if we had time, that would be fun to do. So I made some whole number wavelengths, you could like print out the PDF of the, of the and then tape them in circles. And you too can have your own little um, uh, craft, if you would, of the inside of the atom. Okay, so now we've got electrons with wave-like properties. We got light with wave properties. What's going on here? So there's another, one last idea. We've got to put it all together and it's called energy transfer. You see when waves of, the, of equal types interact with each other, they can interact with each other. If there's things that are of different energy and different wave-like properties, they cannot. So when there is an energy match between two systems, then that energy, uh, if there's no match, the energy goes right through, as I'm illustrating. And if there's an energy match, the energy gets absorbed and then excites everything inside, okay? So here's the big idea. No energy match, energy passes through, nothing happens. Energy matches, energy is absorbed, things happen. I'm gonna illustrate this in just a second, okay? All right, so this is how light and materials start to interact. So we're starting to see really kind of one of the fundamental properties of nature here. If there's an energy match, somehow it's absorbed, if there's not, passes through. That's why I like radio waves, they pass right through us. We, there's nothing in us that matches with the wavelengths of radio waves pass right through, okay? So now, 
uh, oh, I, I did a little demo to help this, help you guys figure this out. And so here's what I did. I took two cups and uh, this is where they match in wavelengths. Watch this. Oh, listen to this. You know? uh, kind of the same. Put a toothpick on there. The vibrations, let's watch that again. The vibrations, those two systems match each other in vibrational energy. When I stimulated one of them, vibrations transferred to the other one and shook the other, the other cup and that vibrated the, the toothpick in. Okay. No match in frequency. Now, that energy is just passing through. It's a fundamental science right here happening in my kitchen and for you guys here. I can go all day, nothing's gonna happen. You can make it louder, softer, doesn't matter. Energy passes right through. Okay, now how does this work for um, atoms? So what happens because of the wave-like property of electrons and the spacing in between these wave systems of electrons, um, scientists like Niels Bohr and others were able to start thinking about the inner workings of an atom. The, it was known that if you excited uh, the gas of a hydrogen, make sure there's no oxygen around, and you pass voltage through it, you would get certain wavelengths of light to come out. This was called the hydrogen atomic emission spectrum. And there was just these certain colors that would show up here after you pass the light through a prism, spread them out. Now Bohr, he went after this. He said, I wonder if I could figure out these wavelengths of light. And remember, wavelengths of light connect to energy. And so he said, well, I wonder if those wavelengths of light have to do something with the energy spacing inside the atom. And he says, what? so we've got these concentric circles, if you would. And he says, I wonder if these levels where the electrons are kind of match to energy spacings. And so when energy comes in that resonates with the energy between, uh, maybe these electrons are moved. They absorb the energy. So that's where we're going next. So... He devised this little model. He said, all right, what if I had an electron here and, uh, and there, see how there's a gap of energy here? If I had light that came through that matched this energy gap, then I could move the electron up. And that process is called an absorption of energy. And it would take the electron that was here and move it up to a different level. But it had to match the energy of that jump, okay? And so uh, this is how Bohr started processing this information. Energy gap, energy gap match with energy of light, electrons start to move around. And he was right on. This is amazing. This is how we understand the inner workings of an electron, of, a, of an atom to see that the electrons are moving around and we do it with light. And it's awesome. And, uh, and he also noticed that if an electron was at a high energy level and if it came back down, then it would give off light that matched the energy of those jumps that it was making. And so he started to do some calculation, calculations. Okay, well, first of all, absorption light is an up arrow. And, a, and then down arrows are emissions of light. The length of an arrow is, uh, has to do with its energy. So he said only certain energies were allowed because there's only just certain places you can put electrons, especially in a hydrogen atom. And then this is the idea of quantum. Quantum energy, quantized, just means you're in different, you have different levels. You can't just go anywhere you want, you have to go in different levels. Quantum nature of materials, okay? So absorption of light, emission of light. And he was able to run a calculation knowing what energy level you uh, start ended with and where you started. These were whole numbers like energy level one, energy level two. And then uh, using this formula, he could predict the energy of that gap. Why that's so special is if you know the energy of that gap, you can then turn that into, um, you could relate that back to HC over lambda. You could relate that back to a wavelength, which is a color, right? Or UV light or infrared or something. 
And, and so he had a pretty simple formula that now connected to uh, wavelengths of light and to predict the atomic spectrum of hydrogen. So this is Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. And it works. And it works pretty good. And so we want you guys to practice putting numbers in and doing some calculations with this. And so let's practice with that. And so calculate the energy for the transition of an electron from N7 to N6. So the energy level seven is way out here and six is in closer. So if the electron is moving from an outer one to an inner one, it's going to have to lose energy. And we say that it's going to be an emission process. It's going to give that off. And so uh, when energy is given off, that is actually uh, a negative number. Okay, negative is given off, right? A positive is absorbed energy. So the sign lets us know where's it going, where's it coming, right? And then uh, the energy spacing, then uh, we can figure out. So uh, is this an absorption or emission process? Well, if I'm going for from seven and I'm going down to six, anything down, energy has to come off. So that's, that's definitely an emission process. Okay, so now we're gonna do the calculation. So the answer for this should be negative because we're gonna be given off energy. So we started here, initial, final, six. So we're gonna use seven and six in our calculations. Now, just as um, another explanation, the, the jumps that are being made in the hydrogen atom, the longer the jump, the more energy it takes to uh, make that jump or the more energy that's given off, okay? So there's the length and then there's direction. So length and direction, we want you to be thinking about in this process. You're gonna get these here in an OWL question. So we wanna look for an emission line that has the longest wavelength. Okay, emission lines. Emission ones are only the ones that are down, 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 down. Okay, so this is either C, D, or E. Now longest wavelength. E, E, joules, H, C over nu. Okay, so long wavelengths, low energy, right? Long wavelengths, you're divided by a big number, you're gonna get a small energy. So if I'm looking for long wavelengths, I'm actually looking for low energy. So which means uh, short arrow and emission means down. So if I'm looking for emission, that's down, and I want the shortest arrow, lowest energy, longest wavelength, ah, that's E. Okay, so with that, we want you to get that kind of interpretation. Now the next one's absorption. So absorption is up and shortest wavelength. So this is gonna be an up arrow, short wavelength is high energy. So this is gonna be high energy and long arrow. Okay, so now I'm looking for, okay, we said this was E, and now we're looking for up arrows, those two right there, and then the longest one, A. Okay, so we're going to be looking at those relationships through there. Now, let me jump down to uh, some of these other ones here. Let's go to the emission line with highest frequency. So emission means the electron is jumped down, and it's given off energy. And then we want highest frequency. Well, E equals H nu. So these are direct. If frequency is high, energy is high. So we're looking for high frequency. So now we're going to be looking for high energy. So that's going to be a down arrow down with a uh, long line. It's like D for that. Okay. Now the very last one, the line that corresponds to ionization energy of hydrogen. Well, ionization energy is a process where hydrogen, uh, when it's given some energy, it absorbs it, and then it kicks off an electron to make a hydrogen anion, cation, sorry, uh, a positive ion. So we need it a place where the electron is actually leaving uh, the atom. Where is that? Oh, the line corresponding to the ionization energy. Well, that is actually what A is. See how it says infinity? It means you've moved it away. And so this is the highest energy absorption right here. So that means you can kick electrons off if you have the right energy of light coming in, you can absorb it, and you lose your electrons. So just by shining the right light onto different elements, you can ionize them. 
And that's, that's a pretty powerful idea. All right, moving on. Okay, so we're going to remember E equals H nu and HC over lambda. So it's kind of like, can you see all those connections that are taking place? And I have all the answers here. Okay, and that'll be in the slides. All right, man, I, this was supposed to come up um, one slide at a time. So, but we can see here, we're going to use the formula and we're now going to plug in and going back to our problem. We started in seven, we go into six. And then what I'd like to do is process this, the information that's here, one divided by six squared minus one divided by seven squared. And that turns out to be 0 0.0730, 7370. And I'm going to take that number and multiply it by negative 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18. This formula is what Niels Bohr came up with. And I get this negative energy here. Now, once I've got this energy, this is the energy to go with the light that's coming off. Which equation am I going to use to relate the what wavelength goes with this energy? Well, we've seen a couple equations with uh, wavelengths, and we want to use A. We want to know what wavelength goes with this energy. So this is the, so I have energy and wavelength. See how there's no E here? So I'm not going to use that equation. Negative means emitted, and so I'm going to use that one. No mass involved. And we're not talking about a particle here at all. Okay, so now I can use uh, E equals HC over lambda, and I can plug it into there, or if I multiply both sides by lambda, then I get lambda, and then I can divide both sides uh, by energy, and I can rearrange the equation to get this, and then plug in the numbers. And so there's a lot of different ways to do this. So there's Planck's constant, check. Speed of light, check. Energy in joules, check. And then I get a negative number. You can't have negative wavelengths, but uh, it just means it's emitted. And this ends up 10 to the minus five meters. And if I convert into nanometers, it's 12,400 nanometers. So there's just, that's kind of like in the, where was that? Oh man, I think that's in the infrared. Yep. So that's a long wavelength infrared. So there is an infrared absorption line for the hydrogen spectrum. So these are some of the problems you're going to work on and, uh, and for your next OWL homework. And why isn't that clear yet? You can step it up the problems here and do one more thing. You can do, um, and I got to get going and we're going to wrap this up with this last question right here. Let's say um, you found out that there is a, a wavelength, uh, an absorption line at 383.8 nanometers. And we know from some other experiment that the electron is in the initially at two. Can we figure out where the electron, oh wait, it ends up in two. Can we see where it started? What do we mean? Well, how much energy, where did it start? Okay, maybe seven, six, five, and it ended up with two, n equals two. Let's see if we can figure out this energy gap here. Well, we know the energy gap is gonna be related to the wavelength of light using this HC over lambda. Convert lambda to meters. Here's the C, here's H. I can figure out the energy now that goes along with this wavelength. This is what all the other training was about, okay? Now I've got an energy. Now I can use that in Bohr's equation. Okay, that's an emitted light, so I'm gonna call it negative. And uh, that's gonna be my E. I'm gonna match that up with Bohr's equation. And it says uh, to reach the energy level for which N equals two. So the final, I'm gonna use N equals two down here. And so the only thing that we're gonna be left over with in this problem now, okay, I'm gonna set all that up, is I'm not gonna know initial. So now we've just got some algebraic uh, manipulation that we got to figure out. So I'm doing that here on the slide. So I plug in my two, that's where I'm starting. I'm going to divide both sides by this negative 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18. Okay. And then I'm going to turn the one over two squared into a decimal. Now I'm going to move the 0.25 to this side and I get a negative number, but I have a negative right here. So that means they both can become positive. Take the square root of both sides, and I get 9.09. That's pretty close to nine. So I can just 
say that's pretty close to the ninth energy level at which this electron started. So we get, we're gonna report whole numbers because that's what uh, the N is here and whatever the closest number. So we can, uh, we're starting to see that Bohr using his understanding of light could start to tell us something about the electrons, how they could jump, how they can move. He could predict the hydrogen emission spectrum. It was amazing. And then, he, then we've now taken that information and we're gonna expand that to understand uh, the orbitals, where are those electrons, they turn out they're not quite, uh, they're not spherical. Some of them are, some of them have weird shapes because this is how we, we wanted to understand. So that's gonna be the next lesson is the shapes of the electron orbits around the, the wave properties around atoms, okay? And uh, they can be like Russian valves, we'll learn about that. So all of this is to learn how electrons are organized in an atom, but there's just been, decades and decades of research that have gotten this to this point. Hey, thanks for paying attention and watching this whole thing. You should be equipped now to go after some of the owl problems. We'll talk to you later.